Preventing Back Injury in Caregivers. So let's start off by defining who this video is intended for. This video is for caregivers. And what we mean by caregiver is anyone that lifts people. So that could be a nurse, it could be a personal support worker, or even an informal family caregiver. In this video, we'll talk about the problem of back injury, what's happening in the body. We'll look at manual lifting, using mechanical lift devices, the limitations of those lifts, and we'll end by looking at a new device that tries to address one of these limitations. So the problem is nurses get hurt a lot. In particular, nurses hurt their backs a lot. The prevalence of back pain in nurses is shocking. For example, in the US, 52% of nurses complain of low back pain. 10% in Canada report severe or unbearable pain. Typically, we find these injuries in the low back. So the question is why? Well, we know it has something to do with all the patient lifting nurses are involved with. We used to believe that the body had some fixed limit for the amount of load it could support, and we experience an injury if we exceed this limit. But experts now agree that this limit isn't fixed. Instead, it decreases over the course of the day. So this means you can perform the same activity over and over and over over the course of the day, and you can perform it safely a whole bunch of times, but then later in the day, that same activity can cause an injury. Basically, every time we load the spine, we change it a little bit, and we reduce how much load it can support. For example, the ligaments in the spine stretch every time we load the spine, but they don't quite go back to their original length once we unload them. Similarly, the intervertebral discs that are filled with water squish a little bit of this water out of them and get a little bit shorter. So these sorts of changes make the spine less stable and less able to support weight. So this sort of creep activity continues over the course of the day. When we lift heavier loads, it happens faster, and when we are just sitting or standing, the creep is slower. Um, but it continues nonetheless, because even when we're sitting or standing, our spine is still supporting the mass of our upper body. And this process only reverses itself at night when we completely unload the spine when we lie down. So experts are increasingly in agreement that there is a cumulative effect here, and that injuries aren't due to a single event, but more likely the risk of injury is due to all of the loading that the spine has undergone over the course of an entire day. So it's not only the weight of the box that you're lifting that matters, but how many times you lift that box. It turns out that this cumulative loading effect doesn't only happen over the course of a day, but can also take place over longer periods of time. So just as our body's ability to support loads decreases over the course of the day, it similarly decreases over years and decades. And so our risk of injury goes up as we get older. And to understand this phenomenon, we need to understand a little bit more of what's going on inside the body. So here's our spine. Let's zoom in on the low back and look at a section of that. So what we have here are two vertebral bodies separated by the intervertebral disc and at the interface between the disc and the vertebral body is the vertebral end plate. And on the back side of the spine, we have the spinal cord, and which feeds a series of nerves that branch off of the spinal cord that run in and amongst a set of bony projections that, that you can feel if you run your fingers down your, your back. They stick out under your skin. The important thing to remember about the spine, and in particular about the intervertebral discs, is that they're living, breathing things. And what that means is that they need a supply of nutrients and they need waste products to be transported away from them on a regular basis. But there's no blood supply that goes to these discs. And so the way nutrients and waste materials flow in and out of the disc is by the movement of water. They diffuse in and out through the porous end plates. So when the spine is healthy and happy, the end plates of the discs are porous and allow water to flow in and out. Basically over the course of the day, we, we squish water out of our intervertebral discs and at night when we lay down again, water go, runs back into them. That's actually why we're shorter at night than we are in the morning. 
But what happens when we lift too much is we start to get little microfractures in the surface of the end plate. Having a few of these microfractures isn't a big deal. Most of us probably have some of these. Uh, we get these microfractures and they heal. There's no pain associated with them. But we start to get a problem when we get too many of these microfractures. The problem is if we're involved in a job where we have to lift very heavy loads on a regular basis, like nursing, we start to get too many of these microfractures. And again, they do heal and they scar over, but the scar tissue now, if there's too much of it, starts to impede the flow of nutrients and waste materials into and out of the intervertebral discs. So over time, the discs in our spine become unhealthy. They start to degenerate. They lead to what's called degenerative disc disease and lead to conditions such as bulging discs or herniated discs that I'm sure you've heard of. So what this means is that the discs can no longer support the amount of weight they should and the nerves that run in and amongst all the bony parts of the spine start to get pinched. And it's this pinching that is the source of most back pain. So the question is, how much load can our spine support without getting these microfractures that lead to degenerative disc disease? The safe limit seems to be 3,400 newtons, which is around 340 kilograms or 750 pounds. This limit is based on cadaver studies where cadaver spines were loaded until they started to show microfracture damage to their end plates. Now, 750 pounds is a lot of weight, a lot more than people typically lift. So if the spine can support that much weight, why do we get back injuries? Well, to understand this, we need to understand a bit more about how the spine works. Let's look at the example of someone lifting a box. When we lift something, our spine acts like the fulcrum of a teeter-totter. Our back muscles, the erector spinae, have to contract to balance the mass of the object we're lifting. So the total force the spine sees is not only the mass of the object, but also these muscle forces. The problem is these muscle forces can be very large because this is such a lopsided teeter-totter. The lever arm of the mass, L1, is much longer than the lever arm inside the body, L2. This is why our back muscles have to generate a huge force sometimes to balance a relatively small mass. You can also see where the idea of using proper body mechanics comes from. The closer you can hold this mass to your body, the less lopsided our teeter-totter becomes, and the lower the loads are on the spine. So the question is, how much can we safely lift to limit the loads on our spine to that 3,400 newtons or 750 pounds so that we can prevent the occurrence of these microfractures in the end plates? Well, for a 200 pound person, they should safely be able to lift about 80 pounds if they're standing straight upright and in good biomechanical posture. But if you bend over and now your spine has to support the mass of your upper body as well as the object you're lifting, now you can only lift around 26 pounds. Tom Waters recently published um, a paper where he suggested 35 pounds should be the limit for how much you manually lift when you're talking about patient lifting activities. Bill Maris showed that whether you have one or two nurses, manual lifting is unsafe. The loads on the spine were in excess of that 3400 newton limit. So that's why we need devices like these, mechanical lift devices. But these devices have been around for 25 or 30 years and we still see alarming rates of back injury. We think part of the problem might be that these lift devices have introduced a new set of activities that may be placing nurses at risk of injury. So my goal was to study the biomechanics of using these devices to see where the risk might be. In particular, we wanted to compare floor lifts and overhead lifts, and we wanted to study the activity of sling insertion. So before you can use either floor lifts or overhead lifts, you have to still get a sling under your patient. Basically, the activity involves rolling the patient onto their side, tucking the sling in underneath from one side, then rolling the patient on their other side, and finally it involves pulling and tugging on the straps to get it aligned properly under the patient. And this is what our studies look like. We have nurses come in and we place reflective markers on them so that we can track the way they move and their posture, and we ask them to wear special shoes. And these shoes allow us to measure the forces the nurses apply in their environment. So if they lift something or they push on something, we can measure that. So we combine the information we get from their posture information and from this force information, and we can calculate the loads that are being applied to the spine. And here's what we found. 
We learn that the forces required to push, pull, or turn one of these lifts with the patient suspended in it was much higher for the floor lift than it was for the overhead lift, whether you have one or two caregivers operating these lifts. In fact, the floor lifts required so much effort that two caregivers working together had higher loads than a single caregiver operating an overhead lift. So we hope these findings will help to convince institutions to purchase overhead lifts rather than floor lifts. Similarly, our study of sling application determined that it doesn't make very much difference whether you have one or two caregivers getting the sling under your patient. It's still a very difficult task. And now that we're commonly seeing much larger patients, 500, 600, 700 pound patients, getting slings under these individuals is unsafe with the current technique. So we've been developing a new tool called Sling Serter that we think might help. The device uses air pressure to inflate a lifting strap under a patient. Here you can see a small compressed air canister being connected to a trigger mechanism, which gets attached to a plastic cartridge containing a lifting sleeve and a strap. Squeezing the trigger inflates the sleeve and carries the strap under our patient. We can now disconnect the trigger mechanism from the cartridge, remove the cartridge from the end of the sleeve, and reach inside the open end of the sleeve to retrieve our lifting loop and now we have a lifting strap positioned under our patient. The idea is you would insert three or four of these straps under your patient, connect these up to a lifting frame, lift the patient two or three inches off the bed, insert your full body sling, put them down on that sling and then use that sling to actually lift them off the bed. When we're ready to remove the strap, the sleeve can be turned inside out on itself. So there's no friction against the body of the patient since there's no relative motion of the sleeve and the patient's body. In fact, it's the same during inflation as well. Since the strap inflates by turning itself inside out, there's no relative motion between the strap and the patient and therefore no friction. This is an early prototype and we're currently working with our commercial partner to develop the next version. So to summarize, using proper body mechanics is not enough to prevent back injuries, so we should be using mechanical lifts for patient handling. Overhead lifts are better than floor lifts, but no matter which type of lift we use, getting slings under patients remains a problem and that hopefully will, a product like Sling Serger may be able to help with in the future. Okay, well, thanks for watching. If you have any comments, please leave them below or send me an email at this address.